thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Barry Flanagan. Uh, I'm joined by David here. Um, we're going to do this webinar today, uh, delivering Office 365 performance that won't get you fired. So we're going to talk a lot about uh, control up in FS Logics and how they can help you both, first of all, understand the challenges with delivering Office 365 performance, specifically on EUC solutions like Citrix, uh, Zen App and Zen Desktop, or I guess I should use the new name, Citrix Virtual Apps and Citrix uh, Virtual Desktops. Um, also, uh, Microsoft RDS and the uh, new, uh, newly announced uh, Windows Virtual Desktop, VMware Horizon, as well in you know, Amazon Workspaces, many of the other solutions are out there. So we're gonna talk about that um, specifically uh, and focus all of our remarks on those specific challenges. There's a lot of challenges in the UC and today we're specifically gonna talk about Office 365. Um, we know there's a lot of EUC challenges. We've been in this industry for a long time, but let's uh, make sure that we stay on target for Office 365 today. If you get enough value out of this, we'll talk about other EUC problems in later dates, but we want to make sure there's so much to talk about in the, in the O365 arena that we want to make sure we dug into that. So let's get going, Barry. All right. Thanks, David. So uh, first, uh, just some brief introductions. Uh, as I said earlier, my name is Barry Flanagan. I am uh, lead America sales for Control Up. I've been with Control Up about six months. I spent about uh, 11 and a half, 12 years with Citrix. I spent about four or five years with VMware. Um, I think uh, I'm really excited about the opportunity here at Control Up. I think uh, we've got a really good product. Um, we've been growing very rapidly the last couple of years, especially in the Americas. And we have some really fantastic new features on the horizon over the next six to nine months that are coming up. So I'm really excited about the opportunity to have here. And with that, I'll pass it to David to introduce yep. you. And, and I'm Dave Young. I've got a pretty extensive uh, history in EUC. Um, we'll start with, I got fired from my first EUC job in 1997. Apparently my bedside manner wasn't very good. Um, I got frustrated with uh, end users that couldn't right click. And then went and spent a few years in the server arena, fell into desktop or server virtualization, and then went back to EUC. And I ran a uh, Citrix environment for a very, very large bank, about 250,000 end users. And at the same time, I was tasked with starting up their virtualization for them. Um, I'll never forget my SE for uh, VMware. I'll, I'll leave the names out to protect the innocent. But he came in one day and he said, what in God's earth are you doing, Dave? Why do you have 37,000 Windows, I think it was XP or 2000 machines running in your VMware environment. So I explained to him that we'd had some challenges. It was Java was the challenge, right? And uh, it was easier for me to give them a virtual desktop, set up DNS so that they could RDP into it, or actually it's PC anywhere into it. And off we went. So I've been doing this EUC thing for a long time. Spent a good stand over at VMware. Um, left VMware, was actually in what we call retirement. Uh, I was done with uh, computers. And a gentleman called me up and now I'm here at FS Logics. So we'll talk a little bit more about the company in just a minute, but I've been in this EUC thing for a long time. I may have been a guy that helped you go down a path that may not be good long-term now that we have new technology. So we'll talk all about that stuff here in a few minutes. Great, thanks for that introduction, David. And as you guys can see from our pictures on the screen, uh, working in the infrastructure software business uh, is both exciting and stressful. That's why David and I both have no hair. So, oh, I thought that was just because we were working at the speed of light. <laughs> yeah, we're streamlined. <laughs> All right, now, of course, my uh, laptop is uh, locking up here. Give me a moment. Uh, I apologize, my uh, PowerPoint just crashed. Uh-oh. Uh, well, we'll talk about a great how to start. start in a few minutes. <laughs> uh, while PowerPoint's recovering, um, I'm gonna. Why don't I just shift into a little about uh, what FS Logics well, I, does and who we are? I got it up. You got it up. Got okay. It. All right. All right. In trouble again. I, uh, of course. Hold on, just a moment. No worries. The demo gods sometimes know um, the days they want to mess with you. 
Yeah, unfortunately, we haven't even got to the demo yet here. <laughs> no worries. Well, while we're talking about that, I'm going to talk about a little bit of the challenge. Okay. So we use the word Office 365 in this marketing, but it really applies to Office in general, right? Anywhere I say Office 365, remember we got marketing people that are on buzzwords, right? And that's where a lot of our headaches have shown up recently because we as organizations have been forced to go down this Office 365 path. And when we look at it in a hosted, whether it's RDSH, a, a virtual desktop, Zen app, uh, VMware view, it doesn't matter, right? When we start to do this in that virtual environment, um, the one thing that we're stuck with is put an office in either <coughs> online mode or cash mode. Now, if you ever heard me speak in the past many years ago, uh, I said the holy grail to virtual desktops was getting a very non-persistent desktop. And as we think about that, what does that do to the end user? It kind of messes with their persistence, right? And when we start to look at Office and the way that Office behaves, it starts to cause us problems, okay? When we just talk about just the OST, okay, for Outlook, it tries to open and close the OST that can range anywhere from megs to several gigs, okay? Um, I think the largest one I ever saw was about 96 gigs of data. Um, there's bigger unicorns out there, but that was the largest one I ever personally saw. And, and when you think about that, that file, which is truly a database, is trying to open and close repetitively. On my watching of it and doing some analysis of it, it's roughly once every other second. So that brings about what's going on, right? That file open, and if you all remember back to your days of designing file shares, it's probably where a lot of us started in this industry. There used to be a formula we would use, and the formula basically like this. Um, users times CPU divided by memory, blah, 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 and we would end up with a CPU count, right? We want to make sure Q wasn't too terribly high. If we had a high Q, that meant that the users would be able to see it. So let's take Outlook, and we're going to just talk about a round even number of 1,000 users, okay? If you have 1,000 users <coughs> running the OST on a folder redirect or a folder share, what happens is it opens and closes every other second, okay? So that's 500 file opens for 1,000 user every second. And as you start to build those up, what happens is the storage – is not designed to support that behavior. And when we look at the, what goes on with the storage, what ends up happening is a whole lot of queuing, okay? Imagine, take your local interstate. If I were to walk out on your local interstate with a stop sign in my bulletproof vest that automatically deflects any bad things that would happen to me and put a stop sign up and make everybody stop at the stop sign in the interstate, wouldn't be too bad if you were the first person. But what if you were the 10th or the 50th or the 500th person? And that's what's ultimately happening on your storage. Everything's queuing up and then Outlook starts to misbehave, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about what causes that misbehavior, but ultimately it times out. So as we start to look at that stuff, there are a lot of challenges to make sure that you don't deploy this in a scenario that's gonna get you in trouble. Oftentimes what has happened is they've deployed this out to all the physical desktops, Nobody talked to the RDSH Zen app virtual desktop team, and then all of a sudden end users are complaining, okay? So we've got some answers on how to help you with that, how to help you find it, right, so that you can prove what's going on and how to monitor that going down the, the future so that you can make sure you're, you're good to go. So with that, Barry, is your uh, PowerPoint behaving better? Uh, no, David, why don't we uh, go ahead and uh, instead of opening up with what is control up, make yourself presenter? And Not a uh, let's start off with what is FS Logics. And I'm uh, uh, unfortunately, it looks like I'm going to have to reboot my MacBook. It's I, I can't get it to do a thing, uh, even with the shortcut keys that are supposed to kill task. So uh, let's uh, go for that option. All right, no worries. So I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about what FS Logics is. So we're really about digital workspace so transfer. You want to make yourself presenter and start with your slides there? Whoops. Did I, you should see slides now. Is that correct? 
I, my my MacBook's locked up, so okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm uh, showing that it's presented. And I got the green arrow, so we're good to go there. Okay. Um, if anybody's not seeing it, just text me a message, and we'll just keep rolling. So, I want to talk a little bit about the company. You know, Barry and I were making fun of each other for having the streamlined haircut because we've been working really fast, right? The more important part I want to talk about, and especially with the FS Logics team in mind, is we're a bunch of gray-haired, bald-headed old farts, with the exception of our sales guy. He's got good hair, good teeth, right? Um, I think sales guys are paid to do that. So the point to this is we have been in this industry for a long time, okay? And seeing things done multiple different ways and multiple different times allows us to say, hey, there's a new way of doing things. So FS Logics was founded roughly about, I think it was 2000. Uh, 12, there it is right there in the first quarter of 2012. And uh, what it was, was a few guys have gotten together and said, hey, we've done this dozens of times before. We know a better way of doing it. So what they had in mind, there's three things they had in mind, some Java stuff, some app stuff, and this profile container. Well, one of the things that we saw was, you know, the profile container, as awesome as it was, uh, a lot of our end customers were saying, hey, I want to use that technology to fix my Outlook problem. And so we customized a piece of that code to solve just that Outlook problem. And ultimately, we did it totally different than it had ever been done in the industry. You'll hear me often say, fetch and retrieve, right? Um, if you look at the way a profile works, I go out to a file server, I fetch a file, I put it down on my logical C drive so that my profile gets built, which that logical C drive is probably on that same file server or storage array that I fetched it from. And that causes a very inefficient way of doing things. With FS Logics, what we're doing is we're inserting a drive. So we'll talk a bit about that in just a second, but I really wanna focus on at this moment point is the transformation, whether we're going physical to private cloud, physical to public cloud. We may have tried the public cloud, maybe it wasn't meant for us, and we need to go back to private cloud or physical cloud. FS Logics is there to help you with that transformation. We give you tools that will enable the data um, replication, as we would like to call it, um, so that that workspace is the same no matter what environment you're in. And we'll talk about some cool features we have here in a minute, but I want to really point out that we're not just blowing our own horns here. Um, some other people thought we were doing some pretty cool stuff. So at Citrix Synergy 2015, we got the winner of Application Desktop Virtualization Award for Citrix Synergy. Okay. Um, in 2018, we got Best of Show and Best New Technology. Now, that 2018 one is very, very important to discuss. We had hired an individual by the name of Gabe Knuth, and Gabe Knuth worked for BrianMadden.com slash TechTarget, and we thought, because TechTarget was the voters, that we had no opportunity of actually winning. Apparently, things were so uh, interesting for them that without you know fear of reprisal, they went ahead and gave us that award. So that was a big one for us, and it really gave us a lot of confidence in what we're talking about and what we're doing. Uh, so David? we're talking today. I see that you're back on, Barry. Yeah, I'm, I'm back. Better? And I just I just like to add that I, I saw the demo you guys had at Synergy this year and I can see why you won because I was blown away. Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. And when you actually start to apply it, it gets even better. Um, so our products, four main modules, Office 365, Profile, App Masking, and Java. You can buy them individually as a suite. Let's just say you decide to buy Office 365 after today's webinar, and you're so blown away about how it does things that you decide you want to add profile containers. Not a problem. It's just a license key. You don't have to change out any software or anything like that. And our infrastructure is very light. We are a filter driver on the end user's machine, wherever that may be, whether it's a VDI machine, RDSH machine, physical laptop, et cetera, et cetera, that connects to a file share. Okay, so you don't have to have a whole lot of infrastructure to get us in place. Let's talk about the one we're here to talk about today, which is Office 365. So as you can see, often what we're doing to get around this persistence thing is people are putting Office data out on some kind of SMB storage, right? SIFS SMB storage. And when we do that, that causes us performance problems. 
Now, with FS Logics in the play, what we do is we transfer that communication, same storage that would give you problems with the OST out there directly because we're handling the communications at a file level. We put that within a container, and by putting that in a container, we mount that on login, and that changes the communication to block level. And by changing that communication to block level, now my file opens and closes are totally different. Um, it thinks it's local. I don't think anybody would say fairly that local Outlook OSTs don't perform well, right? Now, they may not be as fast as we want for whatever reason, right? We can talk about all the problems with desktops and office, blah, blah, blah. But ultimately, that is going to be your best performance environment. And what FS Logix does is we start to take you back to that at local experience as if everything was on the C drive, yet allowing IT the ability to have non-persistence. So it changes what we're doing from a design perspective. And when we talk about cool things, so this is how we work without cloud cache. So the downfall to this is if something happens to my storage, my user's down, right? That could be a storage failover from a controller perspective, a network blip, et cetera, et cetera. Then we've built technology into our product to make sure that we can reconnect that user when it comes back online. But what we ultimately saw is, hey, we need to do a little something more. Right. So what we did is we introduced cloud cache. We kind of changed the communications pattern. We put a little ca cache in the local machine so that it can absorb that outage. So now that outage happens, I'm still talking to the local cache. Anything I got there, I'm still communicating with, I'm queuing up my rights, et cetera, et cetera, so that when that comes back on, we can resync with it. OK. Now, depending on how much you want to do, depends on how much cash you have. You may want to put that in the local machine. You may want to do something fancy, like add a drive to your RDSH host so that you can cache it there. You may want to do something like if you're running Nutanix um, from the Nutanix frame, you might want to create an SMB share so that you could cache there. So anybody hits that frame, it's going to have their cache there. There's a lot of different things that you can do. OK, and those are things that we'd have to actually talk to you about what's going on in your environment so we can understand what the right solution is for you. But ultimately, what we're doing is putting cash in play. OK, now where the cloud portion of the cash comes in is I can add a second storage. OK, second storage location. And that second storage location gives me the ability to flop back and forth. So if I lose access to my first one, now I can you know, automatically or as I like to say, automatically. Um, start reading and writing from the second storage. And when that comes back online, I resync with that and off and roll and I go. Now, those don't both have to be in your data center. We could do that externally, um, do it with an Azure Page Blob, okay? Um, AWS S3, you know, and there's some other things that we're working on. But you could ultimately do it to any other type of storage that we can gain access to, okay? So that gives us that ability to say, hey, now I have my redundancy. Maybe you want everything out in the cloud and you don't need anything local because you know you gave your, your local storage away to the homeless or something, right? So it gives you that ability to implement this in a lot of different manners and a lot of different methodologies. So that's it for what is FS Logix and what we do um, in the Office 365 space. I'm gonna pass it back to Barry. Hopefully his laptop is behaving better and we'll let him uh, talk a little bit about what control up is. All right, thanks, uh, David. I appreciate your flexibility there. So uh, I'm going to cross my fingers and uh, start up PowerPoint here, and hopefully uh, we won't have any more problems today. So let's talk about what Control Up is. So um, you know, I start out with some insights that you can gain from leveraging a technology like Control Up. So one of the things that a lot of people don't realize: uh, your virtual desktops that you have today are likely over provisioned. We've actually recently done a study of 148,000 virtual desktops or virtual machines, 78,000 of which were virtual desktops. Uh, we found that 88% of those uh, 77, 78,000 virtual desktops were over-provisioned on virtual CPU, and about 47% were over-provisioned on virtual memory. Um, so uh, that's common. There's actually a report built into uh, Control Up called a sizing recommendations that'll look at all the VMs in your environment, both uh, servers and desktops and uh, look at average and C peak CPU and memory and give you that insight. Another thing you may not uh, be aware of, publish application logons on, on Zen app or Citrix virtual apps. 
Um, and on RDS uh, are typically 50% faster in duration than uh, full desktop logons. Um, and then finally, and this is something we'll talk about today, Outlook 2016 uses four times as much RAM in live environments as Outlook 2007. And we actually have data to show that and we'll go through that. So uh, similar to uh, FS Logix, we've uh, been a best of synergy uh, winner two years in a row. Uh, we're also Citrix Ready Global Alliance partner. Uh, we're a VMware uh, Ready partner. Um, we're also a Nutanix Ready partner. So uh, um, Control Up is partnering with a lot of the big players in the industry to deliver solutions. And we're getting a lot of recognition from both from uh, you know, other major industry players and also from customers. We have over a thousand customers now across all the spaces. We do exceptionally well in the spaces where EUC is popular, uh, financial services, healthcare, of course, uh, manufacturing, retail, uh, technology companies, uh, utilities, and energy. Um, so let's talk about you know, what control up is and how it compares to the other solutions that you have available out there. So when you're looking for technologies to manage your infrastructure, there are a lot of uh, choices that you have. Of course, you have the typical monitoring tools that come with the infrastructure solution that you buy from Microsoft, VMware, Citrix, and Nutanix. Um, and then there's cross-platform tools. Um, you know, there's a wide range of these cross-platform tools that try to monitor everything and give you a lot of information. Um, there's a uh, newer versions of tools. Oh. Come on. All right, I apologize. I'm having a problem again, so let's try this. PowerPoint is just not working too well today. Uh, let me uh, try and keep it out of presentation mode. Perhaps that will help. I'm not sure what the deal is here, but we'll keep it out of presentation mode. All right, so uh, you know, you see a number of tools. There's a, um, a number of you know tools that are trying to give you a little more information and give you uh, more alerts on what's going on. Um, and then, of course, there's a tool like Control Up. And what Control Up is different from these tools. The others, these other tools are really focused on telling you what has happened and try to learn from that to predict what might happen in the future. Control Up primarily is focused on what's happening right now. So you can understand what's going on, and when something's broken, help you figure out how to fix that. Um, so we we are adding more and more trending analysis, but we're trying to do some unique trending analysis based on what we learn from the troubleshooting experience that we have. Um, so you know that's the big thing that you see with these other vendors out there. Um, you know, there's monitoring and then there's analytics. Most monitoring vendors are trying to overwhelm you with information, and what it becomes is paralysis. By, you know, paralysis by analysis. What Control Up is trying to do is focus on what's happening right now, um, find out what's not working, and help you fix that. In many cases, you can actually fix the problems that you find right from our console. So ultimately, the way I describe Control Up is it's more than monitoring. It's a troubleshooting and fix tool with true real-time monitoring. And what I mean by true real-time monitoring, you can see in the first bullet, you know, we track a wide variety of infrastructure metrics in real time but not every few minutes. Control Up actually collects data every three seconds um, from you know, a wide variety of infrastructure that you have. Whereas most of the modern tools out there collect data between one minute and five minutes. There's even some that, you know, they collect data every 20 seconds, but they only send an average back. You know, they hold that for 10 minutes and only send an average. Control Up is sending you actual metrics every three seconds to see what's going on in your environment. Uh, so, you know, we're finding out what's happening right now, what has happened in the past. And of course, we're focused on trying to help you troubleshoot based on that data um, with the control of virtual expert. And then ultimately triage and fix those problems you find across Citrix, VMware, Microsoft, Nutanix infrastructure right from our console. So uh, we've gone through the what is FS logic. So now let's talk about some specific things about the challenge. So I'll start off uh, with some data that we've learned from our infrastructure you know, Control Up is a hybrid cloud infrastructure solution, so we are able to aggregate data in mass and learn from that data. We talked about some of that already. Um, let's drill down on some things specific to Office 365. And David, I'll ask you to pipe in as you feel the need. As yep, we go and through as this. we get ready to pipe in, so John asked a good question. He says, how's performance impacted by things like mailbox size and Outlook? And, and I want to kind of cover that here real quick. So as we start to look at the data, we can apply that question to the answer. So, um, John, one of the problems that we have is it really doesn't matter, okay? 
Um, what really matters is what the user's behavior is like. So if you think about how you use mail, the problem with online mode is every message that I click in, I gotta go pull from the web so that I can actually view it, okay? And when we multiply that you know, for online mode times thousands, right? What happens is we get congestion at the web layer, you know, the interface to the exchange servers across the web, and it causes contention, okay? And the biggest problem there is I read the email that John just sent me, and then I wanna go look at an email that Barry sent me that kind of answers the problem, and then I go back to John's email, there's three pulls right there, okay? So by changing to an online, um, or from an online to a cached mode, what that gives us the capability is those three transactions were trickle streamed in the background and are you know, three transactions period, but if I go back and forth, it actually reduces the number of transactions and the actual data pull is only the two that we originally pulled, although I'm going from the original email to somebody else's email back to the original email, I'm not having to pull data multiple times. And when we look at it from a cash perspective, size doesn't matter. Um, it's kind of weird that it would come down to that, but I have seen mailboxes, you know, 96 gig or 100 meg perform just as well in a local cache, whether it's on local cache or local cache with Equus Logix scenario. So with that, let's hit some of these uh, numbers that you found there, Barry, and talk about those. All right, thanks for covering that, David. Uh, so, uh, you know, one of the things that, as I said, uh, we aggregate data, so we're able to look across a wide range of, uh, of our customers and give you some insight into what's going on. And the goal that Control Up is trying to do is start to learn what's going on in your environment and ultimately start to su suggest ways to fix what's going on in your environment. In the beginning, we're doing that through research, but ultimately we want to build that in into our, our, our tool itself so you can use it on a daily basis. So one of the things we looked at is office average application load time. So uh, you see here on Excel, you know, we saw across 245 organizations, we monitor 23 million launches of Excel. Um, surprise to me that Excel actually on average launches a little, you know, a little less than five seconds faster than Word. The standard deviation is not that high. Of course, you know, Excel typically, if you have massive spreadsheets that are on file servers, um, that can really impact the load time for Excel. And there is a lot, when you look at the raw data, you can see a wide range in here. But of course, a lot of people, you know, are starting Excel um, blank with no spreadsheets, so that actually impacts the data. Um, next is Word. So you see, it's a little under seven seconds on average, starting with a high five and a half seconds uh, deviation across 233 companies. One thing I did find is the when we look through the data, and we actually have all this in a, 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 a research paper. You can go to controlup.com/controlup-research. The recently used file list is actually known to delay. Um, the document load time. So that's something you can actually change through either a registry entry or a group policy to improve. Um, the number of fonts that you allow, obviously if you're doing this in the EU environment, you have control over how many fonts are allowed. Uh, you can't do much about embedded graphics, but you can do it by the setup of auto grammar check and spell checking. If you're having performance issues with Word, those are some things to look at, including having it start in draft mode. Um, so these are certainly some options that you have to look at with a, a Word. A uh, next uh, outlook, so David just uh, gave a really good explanation of the different things to consider in Outlook. If you look at the data that we have here, Outlook averaged 10.1 or, or 10.9 seconds uh, across 219 organizations with a high, the highest average de deviation, the highest average. If you look at the other ones, you know, less than five, less than seven, Outlook's 11, uh, PowerPoint is five and a half. Um, so it has the highest. When I look at the range, there were some customers starting in a three or four seconds, and then I saw some that were in the 20 second average. And this is the average across every single user, every single launch. So you can imagine the range, and depending on how people are set up, actually has a huge impact on how long it can take Outlook to load. So another bit of research that we've been doing, and we haven't published this yet, but uh, we just started doing this, is looking at the impact of different versions of applications on CPU and memory. And we actually have some of that available now for some of the Office applications. So first, we'll start off with Excel. So you can see here, we look back through Excel 11 up through Excel 16. And of course, you know, these are the versions as reported by the process. Um, of course, publicly, like Excel 12 is actually, you know, Excel 2007. Excel 16 is Excel, you know, a part of Office 2016. So you can see here, uh, Excel version 12, actually from both a RAM and a CPU perspective, 
perspective, used substantially more than the other versions. So uh, if you're still running the 2007 version of Office or Excel, uh, that's certainly going to impact the performance in your EC environment. You see it's gotten much better from a C CPU perspective, still a little bit high on RAM, but not nearly as, as high as it was in version 12. Um, and then we can look at Word. The interesting thing about this to me is the massive increase in the amount of memory that Word uses from version 11, uh, which I think was uh, Office 2004 up through uh, Word and Office 2016. So huge increase in the amount of RAM. And of course, as you go through new versions of Office on your Citrix or your VMware or your RDS environment, um, a lot of people just drop the new version on and uh, don't look for an impact on scalability. But this is something that you have to consider, um, obviously. And then finally, we'll look at Outlook. So there's not only, you not only need to look at how Outlook is set up, but you can see here, you know, Outlook version 12, which was from uh, Office 20, uh, 2007 uh, through Office 2016, it actually uses more than four times as much RAM. Um, so a really significant increase in the amount of RAM. The CPU has gone up quite a bit too. Of course, the, the average is very low, um, but again, this is every single launch. So some user, you know, a lot of users just let it sit idle and running in the background. So that skews the CPU numbers a bit, but on RAM, you can see there's a significant impact um, on the different versions that you're running. So that's definitely something that you need to consider um, and, and you need to test um, when before we, when you roll out. That, one of the cool things, or maybe not so cool things I found out, was if you're running Outlook in online mode, and I'll show this to you here in a few minutes, and you do a search, right? Um, in online mode, what happens is Outlook asks the Outlook, the O365 servers out in the cloud repetitively, did you find it yet? Did you find it yet? It's kind of like that annoying kid um, in on the car ride that you go on for a long time, just keeps asking over and over and over again. I watched this literally eat 30% of the CPU. And when you think about it, you know, how many of us, you know, and, or how many of our end users open up Outlook, start a search for an email, get distracted, whether it's for five minutes or they walk away and go to lunch, maybe for an hour, and it sits there and eats up resources. So these types of things as we're doing our design are things that we need to consider as we try to make it as optimal as possible. So just a little hidden secret, and if you go into cache mode, it uses very little of the search uh, index piece at that point. All right, thanks for that, David. So uh, one more point, uh, we did do some testing um, specifically for this webinar to look at the performance of Outlook um, in different modes. So this is, you know, uh, we didn't do a scalability load simulation. Well, we did uh, set up a, a few users. We used a mailbox that uh, David and FS Logix was gracious enough for, to provide that obviously has a lot of mail in it, so it was more of a realistic test. And we looked at the difference in the log on time and then the average app load time for the different scenarios here. So you can see on first log on, if you're on online mode, the average of the log on with nothing else running was 32 seconds. And you know, so that's with a, a very well tuned login script, uh, minimal group policy uh, issues, and uh, you know, the, the desktop load time was very fast. So just Outlook itself made a huge difference. The second time you logged on, it dropped to 11 seconds, and obviously there's some setup there the first time you log on. And the app load time was pretty high at 20 seconds. If you recall, the average app load time um, across all those a wide range of customers was 11 seconds. So you can see a big difference um, when you're using the online mode. And then when you're using the cache mode, and in this scenario, we use cache mode with a network-based OST, you can see the app load time um, the first time you load in, the, the log on time was 18 seconds. It dropped to 13 on the second log on, and the load time was higher on that first time as well. Um, and so one thing you need to do when you look at these numbers is extrapolate. I'm sure many of you have many more, um, you know, have multiple multiples of Outlook users, you know, probably hundreds or thousands of those. So you can imagine the impact. Um, these numbers and the disparity gets bigger and bigger as you add a load in that. We'll actually talk about that as we go through the demos. So, uh, David, anything to add on that before we jump into some demos? No. Um, what I was going to do, do you want to demo first or do you want me to demo first? Yeah. Let me uh, jump in here and uh, I'll uh, do a, a brief demo and I'll show those uh, videos that we have and then uh, we'll flip it over to you just to minimize the screen flipping. Yep. And while you're getting that all rolling, um, gentlemen asked that this webinar be available 
um, for download later. And I believe the short answer to that is yes. I just want to make sure I say that out loud for everybody. So if you want to share it with your coworkers, please do. Um, you know, if you don't want them to see it because you want to be the hero, well, it's not good playing in the sandbox, but we'll uh, allow that. Yeah, so we'll uh, make the we'll uh, upload this to our YouTube channel so you can watch it later, and uh, we'll share it with the FS Logic guys so they can do the same. All right, so briefly, I'm not going to show you everything that's available with ControlUp, but I'll go through a few uh, common scenarios to show you how you can use ControlUp. So this is our real-time console. We also have a historical monitoring console that we call Insights, where you can see some of those historical reports I mentioned earlier, the sizing recommendations. Uh, you can see that report in Insights. You can also see some of our application statistic, statistic reports. One of the things that it's interesting beyond the infrastructure metrics that we can report on is concurrent total concurrent user usage of a app and unique name user uh, usage of an app. So obviously a lot of licenses are, are, are applications rather are licensed on those two scenarios. So I found uh, quite a few customers who found out that they were paying, say they're paying for you know, a thousand uh, name users for an application and they found out through control up that oh, they're only using 600 and the other 400 they were paying, you know, support and maintenance and upgrades for 400 people that they were never using. So there were substantial savings available for them uh, through Insight. So this is the uh, view, you know, you can add hypervisors, you can add computers. What we're looking at right here is a host view in control up. Um, so we're looking at all the hosts we have in our demo environment. One of the things I want to uh, highlight is our assisted troubleshooting capability. So you see these three little bars. Let me unclick that. You see these three little bars right here next to this. Uh, this has, host has a high stress level. Um, obviously, IOPS are where the problem is. So uh, this brings up the virtual expert. It tells you what the threshold is that was crossed, and it suggests the next step. So this thing, we should look at the, the computers or VMs running on that host. But because this is an I.O. related metric, it's going to only show I.O. So we'll click on that. It puts the host at the top. Now we see all the VMs on that host. It puts a blue box around, you know, this metric because this is the one that's exceeding the threshold the most. And you can see the three bars there again. So there's more input from the virtual expert. It says to go look at the sessions. Um, so this VM happens to be a, an RDS server. So I can see this session right here is where the problem is. It's at the top. Click on the virtual expert one more time. I'm gonna now I can look at the processes in that environment itself. So now I found the exact process where the problem is. Um, you know, I've drilled down in just a moment and found the exact process. So you know, I have a few op options. I can click on the user session. I can chat with a user. I could actually, you know, I can go look at the programs and updates on their system. Look at the registry and compare it to other systems. See if they're supposed to be identical. Um, I could kill group policy and go. Uh, you know, do an RDP into that session, um, and then reapply group policy. And then if I click on the process, I have a few other options here. One of them is get a session screenshot. So I can go take a session screenshot without notifying the user, see exactly what they're doing. And of course, it's configurable whether or not you want to notify them, and you can set that as a policy. So you can see exactly what they're doing. So in this scenario, say I decided uh, that, you know, I'm going to let them run at the business process, but I want to throttle it. So I actually have that option. I can right click, go down to processes and start CPU throttling on that specific process. So it gives you a lot of control to drill down um, specifically. And next we'll go into a view um, specific to uh, EUC. So I'm gonna go and change the uh, preset. I'm gonna look at sessions and change the preset to look at user experience. So one of the things you can see here, um, you know, we have a, quite a few users here that have a high stress level. And these guys right here actually have a high logon duration. And I can see right away, because we break logon duration down, I can see that it's group policy. Now, one thing I'll say, this is another way that you can use control up to identify problems that FS Logics can fix, since they do have a profile container, and obviously profiles can play a significant role in your logon time. Um, so this is one of the things that you can track what the logon time was before FS Logics and break it down by the individual, individual components and after FS Logics. And we do actually have what we call a script-based action um, that allows you to drill down deeper into log on time. So there's one that goes uh, called analyze log on duration um, that gets really, really deep into the components. You can actually use it to find Office 365 issues. And then we have another one here, since this is a group policy related issue, you can see group policy is taking 37 seconds. I'm gonna right click here and go run a script based action. This is a PowerShell script that we can import and point right to the uh, 
specific objects that you want and analyze how long each GPO took to load. And in this scenario of the 37 seconds, this policy at the top, group policy drive max, took 35 seconds of that 37 seconds. So I can't edit group policy for control up, but now I know exactly what the group policy is that's causing the problem. And of course, you know, in a lot of environments, people have 50 to 100 group policies. So it's important to know exactly which one is the problem. So that's an overview of the tool. I do want to show one more thing before I pass it over to David. We actually did some scenarios with David's help to look at the impact of FS logics on a, on a login. So what we have here. Before you do that, Barry, before you do that John asked that other question. He asked, uh, can you tell which app launched the process? Can you tell which app launched the process? Yes. Um, you, you can see which apps are located in the process. Um, um, there are a number of ways to do that through control up itself. And then we're actually, uh, because sometimes that can be difficult, um, we're adding some new uh, script-based actions that allow you to track um, um, processes, you know, processes impact, specific processes impact on um, how much disk uh, I.O. they're taking and how much network I.O. So there are a number of ways that you can drill down. If I flip back over um, to my demo here, um, there's actually a process uh, object at the top where you can track all the processes. And, you know, there are a number of metrics available and quite a few presets that are available. So you can really drill down into specifically, uh, you know, the processes that you have in your environment. And you can do, there's an, uh, um, an application object as well. So a lot of drill down into processes and application available when a control up. Awesome. And, and as we shift over this demo that we're going to show off, so one of the questions I get off, asked often is, you know, Dave, uh, we know our users are complaining, right? But we don't know how bad it is, and we don't know how to, to show how much better it's going to be. So often I will tell a user, you know, hey, here or an, an admin, let's get this deployed. Let's get pushed out to three or 400 users, and you go back and tell the end user that you're going to take it out and put them back the way it was three hours or three weeks or three months ago. And that doesn't go over very well. So what we worked with control up and why we're partnering with control up is we really want to be able to give you the admin, the details to just say, Hey, this is what it was before. This is what it is after so that you can justify that it actually did well. So the demo we're going to show, there's a little jest in this. Okay. Um, we want to show you exactly how bad it could be. So uh, Barry's going to fire off that demo real quick, and we'll give that a quick watch. And this may be a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's not much of an exaggeration. Yeah. I see these things all the time. So let so let me set this up. So what we're going to do first, you're going to see that we're going to that we have FS logics disabled. We're going to go and run Outlook. We have the OST uh, in cache mode, but it's on a network uh, file server that's really getting hammered. And this is just one user, so the performance actually could be worse. Uh, the uh, file server, you may not uh, have your file server getting hammered to the extent, but we really want to show the power of FS logic by making one simple change by enabling FS logics. So you can see here, FS logics is disabled. Look in the registry. So we'll flip over to uh, storefront, and we have the control of console running in the background. We'll flip over to storefront, connect to Outlook. All right, so you can see it's going to take a, quite a few minutes here for Outlook to start up. Um, it, you know, it's, this is a published application logon, so the session hasn't even completely launched yet, but it's actually pretty slow. You'll see it's much faster on the one where FS Logics is enabled. Um, so, and now it's finally got to where Outlook is launching. Um, and of course, the Outlook launch is going to be pretty slow as well. We're starting to track of the data, and we actually start getting some errors. And the, the, the Origin of these errors is because the file server is getting hammered um, where the OST is located. Sometimes it has trouble locating that. You can see it, it really affects the performance. So this is a an extreme example, but since we we're, weren't able to simulate, you know, several hundred or a thousand users, we wanted to show you an example where there's really can be an impact of that file server on the user. You can see as it goes through Outlook, it continues to have that problem. So we'll stop this video. And close that one. Now we're going to show this is the exact same user, the exact same session, the exact same file server. Everything is identical with one change. We enabled FS Logics. So you'll see at the top, you know, uh, our Marcel, our SE shows in the registry that FS Logics is enabled. So we'll go and start it. FS Logics is enabled. It'll flip over to storefront and uh, start running Outlook. 
here in just a moment. So bring up control up in the background, start running Outlook. And you'll notice right away the, uh, the log on time is going to be much faster. Um, uh, you know, it's going to start up quite a bit quicker. And then the app load time itself, once the session is available, it's going to be much faster as well. And no errors. Yes. And so we haven't got into where you see the application yet. Um, but you'll see that here in a moment. It's bringing it up. It's set all the user settings, the Citrix user profile management. Um, so it's going to bring that up. And now Outlook is loading. And you'll see the Outlook's going to start up much faster. And there'll be no errors. And the overall performance is going to be much better uh, using uh, FS Logics on this, you know, with this network OST. And so you can see, uh, you know, we're tracking the app load time. You can see the performance is much better. It doesn't matter now that a, that a file server with OST is getting hammered because FS Logics is taking care of all of that and really making a dramatic improvement in the overall performance for this end user and the ability to use some additional features that you may not have been using before, like search. Um, and that's one of the things that FS Logics, and I'll, I'll leave that to David to talk about, but search is one of the things uh, that you can enable and get a much better performance with when you're leveraging FS Logics. So with that, I'm going to stop the video and I'm going to turn it over to David to show a full FS Logics demo. So I actually expanded my cache out to, I guess it's three years, right? Um, so what's happening in the background is Outlook is saying, hey, we need to bring that up to date. And if you look here, it's updating my deleted items. Apparently I have a lot of deleted items. My inbox is fully up to speed. I'm going to just do a search diamonds. You'll notice that it starts bringing stuff back. Let's take this out a little further. Um, you see that things are happening now. Let's look at what goes on, on with performance, right? So if I bring up just the simple task manager and fire this up in just a second, and let's get to, there we go. So notice where the CPU is, and it's doing stuff, right? Um, apparently I got 58% utilized. Let's figure out what that 58% is. That 58% is not Outlook. Outlook is 13%, but it is, let's see what the big hitter is. It's Windows Search re-indexing everything, right? So between Search re-indexing, because I added some stuff and all that good stuff, and Outlook, we're at about 26%. But notice how snappy all this stuff is. And if I actually open up my Search Index, give me a second, there we go, let's go to Options. We should see that it is adding some stuff to the index. So there it goes. It's got 11 items. So because I stretched that out from six months to three years, you can see that it's gathering additional items. Now, once it's done, that data will go from session to session with me. So I don't have to recreate this every time. I only have to recreate it once. Now, hopefully you're not index, you know, changing from six months to three years often, but you can see that I added that to it so that it can update the OST as it exists. So what does the FS Logic solution look on the back end? That's, that's the important part. So let me close this and let's take a quick roll through this. I have on my desktop somewhere an ODFC batch file, there it is. So what I'm gonna do is fire up some stuff so we can take a look at it. We'll start with what's the configuration, all right? So I often get asked, Dave, what do I need to make this happen? So here we have a series of reg keys. So the most important one is the enable key. That's what turns us on. And the next most important one is where we're doing it. Now this is a closed demo environment that I use every day. So I've got it on localhost, whack, whack, localhost, and FS Logic. But that could be any SIS SMB compatible share. Okay, so we pointed out there, we're not doing anything fancy. I'm going to actually show you the SIFS SMB share. Here it is. If you look in here, I've got two VHDs. So my ODFC VHD is slowly growing. It's adding some stuff to it because, hey, it's a, since you expanded this out, I need to add some stuff to it. But it's just a simple SMB mount. Okay, if you look over here in the folder, this is important to see here. I'm in Outlook, right? Um, as soon as I click on this, and this is uh, C users, demo user, update a local Microsoft. And as soon as I click on Outlook, I am now inside that VHD. Okay. And those VHDs are just simply mounted as virtual hard drives here in Disk Manager. You can see them. I actually have a drive letter assigned to them so that we can actually see what's inside them. 
and I will mount or explore this so you can see. Notice when I go into ODFC, I should have a new text document. There it is. That should be the same as the one in here, and it is, right? So what we're doing is we're intercepting that user's local path and making it as part of the environment, as if it was local. And notice when we're up here, right? Whoops, nope, I'm sorry. Notice when we're here, let's close the up here one. When we're here, that it doesn't appear to be any different than any other folder on the system. And you often hear me say, not all BHDs are created the same. So let's talk about a little of what that is and what the true, David? yes. So I just, sorry to interrupt you, but I see that uh, one user, Dan, has his hand raised. Uh, I just let Dan know. Dan, if you type your question into the uh, question panel, we can uh, uh, address that as we go through the session. Awesome. So as we start to look at why these VHD mounts are not all the same. So here's an FS Logics one. I'm going to go straight down to my Outlook. There it is. So you can see App Data Local Microsoft Outlook is being intercepted into disk four. OK, um, just to show you different things are happening. Here's my profiles. Demo user, right, is going into volume three. And we're managing all these intercepts so that we can make sure that it all appears as if local. Now, here's what I say, you know, not all junctions are created the same. So here you can see I've got what I call bad VHD, just, just a normal junction, okay? Anybody can go and mount a junction. It's an old trick. I even taught my mom how to do it. So I can say anybody and my mom can do it. Um, but the more important part is making sure that the app, the OS, the user, and even the admin at times does not know that this is a junction. So Take a look here. Here's my outlook, right? Notice with us involved, it shows up as just a directory, okay? Notice my OneDrive shows up as just a directory. As a little add-on to this, because it's never just mail, right? There's always these other things. I'll show you OneDrive working here in a moment. But it's ultimately making it so that this, the, the operating system believes that this stuff is local. That way, when I open, Outlook, and we'll just go ahead and fire up Outlook, you'll see it doesn't know that it's any different, right? It's saying, hey, I've got some stuff to do. I need to update this folder because you've been offline for a few minutes. It's going to go through and do its thing, right? Um, ultimately, building out my cache, right? Um, now it's going to do the clutter, right? It's going through all that stuff, and it's going to go back to deleted items because apparently I have a lot of deleted items. So it's going to behave as if it was local. And if I opened a Excel spreadsheet or a Word document or anything like that that was across that junction, we don't want the, um, the app low integrity mode or data protection services freaking out because they go over a junction. So we make sure that that is not viewable so that those things just work as desired. And an example of that is notice I have OneDrive installed here and I will show you just so everybody knows because this People have questions on this often. What are you showing? So let's go Winver, right? So this is server 2016, okay? And I have OneDrive here. It says it's up to date. Some stuff going on there. My go-to webinar is hiding that. I got some stuff in there, right? So let's actually go and look at that folder. So let's see what the interface looks like. So here you can see I'm on my PC. Um, I come up to my OneDrive, and it looks just like a normal interface that any user is used to seeing. I'm not conflagrating it. I'm not changing it. I'm not doing a disk mount or a folder mount. I'm just, it, it behaves and looks as if it is normally. And we'll just go in here and show you that it works. I do these often. I clean it out sometimes. Um, let's go and add a new file in here. So we'll just go do new. And we'll choose a open document spreadsheet. There we go. So control up demo with FS logics. And I'm going to add some numbers and letters down here just to make sure it's totally unique. I hit enter. And in about three to five seconds, depending on how big it is, it's going to turn green. It's replicated. It's out there. Right. User didn't have to do anything special. It just works as desired. And it gives a performance that a user is used to. You know, I used to say, if you don't do better than what they had before, 
you're not doing very well. And if you think about it, you know, I'm sure a lot of you commute to work. Um, let's just say you're very lucky and you've got an awesome infinity, one of those pretty little infinities, you drive to work in it, and, and it's great, right? Would you be just as happy with me if you turned it in and got the Yugo, right? And if you're not old enough to know what a Yugo was, please go Google it. It's kind of funny. Um, we used to say Yugo, maybe. Um, so, you know, it wouldn't be the same ride, right? Wouldn't be the same experience. You know, you wouldn't be as happy about your commute to work. So think about that from an end user perspective. Um, the last thing is let's talk about productivity. If I save, you know, five minutes a day um, per user, and let's just go with some, some fun numbers. So let's go, I'm breaking up the calculator just in case you want. Let's go five minutes a day times a thousand users. So that's 5,000 minutes in a day that you might be able to save them in productivity. Multiply that by, what is there, 200 work days in a year. Uh, so that's a million minutes. So let's divide that by 60. And that comes out to be like 16,666 hours of productivity that you're returning to the end user. If you don't get a raise for that, you didn't document it properly, okay? Um, these are the types of things that increasing that productivity, driving down costs, making things better. Um, as engineers, we need to make sure we're documenting and presenting back to management so they know that, hey, we're not just buying toys, that we are actually going out and making sure that, you know, we're fixing things and making things better. So that's the high-level demo of FS Logics. Implementation time, um, less than an hour. Generally, I get this set up in a customer's environment in about 15 minutes. I take them through the deep dive of what's going on on their, you know, in their environment so that we can make sure they understand it. If they don't understand it, what happens is anytime there's a problem, it's, oh, I introduced FS Logics. It must be FS Logics, right? So we like to make sure you guys are properly educated so that you can go through this demo or pilot and make sure that it's working properly in your environment. So with that, I'm going to open up to John, or I'm sorry, I'm reading a question. John had a question. I think we answered that. I'm going to open up to Barry to see if there were any more questions that we need to cover. Nope, no uh, new questions during that. I think uh, we'll just cover the resources and jump right in the, to the overall Q&A. So uh, I put together some resources, resource links for us. Uh, so, you know, I talked about our app load research. If you go to controlup.com slash controlup dash research slash application load time, you can find that uh, white paper. It drills down and we have uh, more information on our blog. FS Logics has a blog as well at blog.fslogics.com and a lot of really uh, nice uh, demo videos available as well straight from their website. So, so I'm going to start the questions there, Barry, um, and, and I'll give the FS Logics answer. What do they need to get started with a control up de a pilot demo? Yeah, thanks uh, for asking that. So, uh, control up, uh, similar to FS Logics, is very easy to set up. Uh, you just go to controlup.com, click uh, download trial at the top. Um, you can download it. It's a, and it's an executable. Um, we do an NRAM database for the real-time console, so you don't have to set up a back-end uh, a database server. Um, and then you set it up. You can be up and running in 15, 20 minutes um, with the basics. Um, and uh, there are a number of things that you can do there. You can add in hypervisors. We do API connections to uh, um, to vSphere, to Hyper-V, Zen Server, and Nutanix Acropolis. And uh, then you can add in Zen Desktop. Uh, we do an API integration to Zen Desktop, and we have one coming for VMware Horizon. And then you go in and add the individual VMs and computers. That we'll distribute the agent right from the console. So it's really easy to set up the back-end cloud, back-end data, the, the, the historical data goes up in our, our Amazon Cloud instance. So uh, you can literally be up and running in 20 minutes um, and leveraging control up and gathering real-time metrics for your environment. So so to add on to that, the FS Logic side, about the same thing, right? You need a virtual machine to install the filter driver into and a file share to uh, point the data at. Um, literally less than 20 minutes. I had a customer um, a couple months ago, I'll leave the names out to protect the innocent, um, but she had implemented some things and her login times had went up to about 80 seconds. And she was very frustrated. Um, she laid the blame on FS Logics first. I got the control up team to uh, help me out and uh, found out exactly what her problem was. And in less than an hour, 
working with her, we had not only you know installed, analyzed, and found out but we had helped her fix the problem so that she can move forward. So, you know, those are good things. Those are great wins, right? Um, and we see that often. Oftentimes, I will, you know, see a customer, they implement our profile solution, and they're like, um, but it's still, you know, slow. And we bring that in control up, and it shows all the login scripts that are happening, right? Um, so we can help them address those. So it is a way to help make your environment, uh, you know, a very fine-tuned machine. Well, thanks for that, David. And, uh, you know, I, I, we've had uh, quite a few customers that are leveraging us to look at uh, profile performance and office performance. And, uh, you know, what we've seen, similar to what you've seen with Controller, we've actually seen the same thing with FS Logix. Um, very simple to implement. Um, it makes a huge difference in performance. And that when I saw your demo for your cloud cache and for your Office 365 um, that you offered at, uh, uh, that you were showing at Center this year, I was really impressed with the performance that you guys offer and the improvement in performance and how simple it was to set up. There are a number of solutions out there, um, you know, that try to tackle this problem, but some can be quite complicated to implement. So that's one thing you guys have really captured is how to make it simple to set up. Maybe so we what David, a good job, they don't have any questions. But that's uh, entirely possible. Um, so uh, David, uh, what kind of trials do you guys offer? We offer a 21 day trial on our website. Um, what kind of trials do you guys offer? We offer a totally uninhibited 30-day. Um, sometimes change in the end user's environment takes a little longer. And we have worked in enterprises, so if you need a little more than 30 days, we get it. As long as you're making progress forward, that's what we want. Um, but most of my customers, literally less than 10 days, they go from implementing their proof of concept to let's roll out into production. Okay, so I see we got a new question from uh, Stan. Uh, says, can I use legacy devices? Stan, I'm not really sure uh, what specifically you're referring to there. Uh, with Control Up, of course, you can uh, leverage, you know, a wide range. Our agent supports um, back through, uh, I believe it goes back through Windows Vista. Um, so you can support older versions of Windows with the agent if you have to install the agent. And of course, if you're monitoring VMs, if we can connect to the hypervisor, we can see, you know, underneath the VM and collect a lot of data um, as well. Um, so we have a number of different ways. Uh, David, is there anything specific to legacy devices for? Yep, so from an FS Logics perspective, Windows 7 and higher, Windows Server 2008 and higher. And the only caveat that I have to give you there is search is uh, multi in single user mode. It's the entire database in multi user mode. It is just the Outlook calls that we're capturing for search. We appreciate you all, all of you joining us today. For the webinar, uh, if you have any questions, of course, you can visit us at uh, www.controlup.com. You can visit uh, David's FS Logics team at www.fslogics.com. So we appreciate everyone taking the time. Um, thank you, and have a good day. Cheers, all.